Thank you for joining the Global Future Mobility Virtual Conference. And with me, I have two special guests, Miss um, Shervan Sharma. Uh, she is uh, basically an urban planner. And I've also got uh, Professor Roberto. Uh, he is basically uh, a professor of aerospace engineering. So I'm going to do a deeper introduction uh, to the session to uh, the session right now, which is about a look at the air traffic and urban transport uh, planning in global markets and developing countries. So we have quite a wide scope of uh, topics to speak about. But so with me, I'm going to start off with introducing uh, Shervani. So Shervani, she is actually a social scientist um, as an urban transport planning as her main subject. Uh, she did her she did her undergrad from CPT University in India, and her masters in urban transport and big data from University of Glasgow, UK. So she's gained gained a lot of exposure to novel sources of big data available from the Urban Big Data Centre, and these experiences have actually positioned her well on hands-on analysis required for many transport planning projects. So she has worked on uh, on projects such as um, the ARUP Glasgow, IRADE India, WRI India, DULT India, and TNCP India, among other things. So um, she's especially passionate about autonomous vehicles, travel behavior, transport and social exclusion, multimodal integration, ICT and all that. And with me also, I have Professor Roberto Sabatini. He is from uh, RMIT University, specializing in avionics, air traffic management and autonomous intelligence systems for aerospace and defense applications. Uh, currently, he serves as a chair of the Cyber Physical and Autonomous Systems Group. He's, he is a deputy director of the Sir Lawrence Beckett Center and director of the Autonomous and Intelli Intelligence Systems Laboratory at RMIT University. So, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Roberto, what is the connection between sustainable transit, sustainable cities, and climate adaptation? It's a very interesting question, and uh, uh, it requires uh, a considerate answer. Uh, it's also a broad question, so I will try to focus on uh, some of the most important uh, elements in some aspects uh, and perhaps uh, look at the areas, the potential areas of intervention. Um, so the, the evolution of uh, uh, multimodal transport in uh, uh, present day smart cities is uh, uh, clearly one of the greatest opportunities and you mentioned uh, the introduction of autonomous vehicles with the uh, uh, increased level of uh, uh, not just autonomy but intelligence so um, one of the key areas uh, is not just on the vehicle but on the infrastructures and uh, the communication between vehicles and infrastructure that need to take place so this calls for advancements in uh, autonomous cyber physical systems and also uh, closed loop human machine systems of various kinds. Uh, human machine systems are evolving from uh, um, what we call at the moment uh, uh, closed loops, uh, human machine system towards cognitive. So systems that can adapt uh, uh, in various situations and uh, uh, can be supported by human if and when required. Uh, and in the long, in the long term, also uh, we expect uh, cybernetic systems uh, to effectively play an important role. I'm talking about the long term future uh, towards 2030, 2040. As uh, um, uh, the scientific community uh, is uh, evolving concepts on robotic and autonomous systems and uh, advanced cyber physical uh, system architecture which employs sensor networks advanced communication and advanced computing 
with the pervasive adoption of artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms, uh, there is a need, uh, obviously, for the regulators, uh, policymakers and regulators to address uh, <clears throat> the sustainability challenges uh, that uh, uh, effectively the increase, the increased demand uh, on uh, uh, multimodal transport and autonomous transport brings. And when looking at sustainability challenges, uh, I like to uh, stress the importance of adopting an holistic approach. So it's not just about the environmental sustainability. And in my previous interview, in my previous discussion, I address uh, the gases emissions as one of the key uh, challenges, and also the noise emission reductions that uh, indeed uh, become particularly important in urban environments. So I think really, uh, again, it's about uh, uh, looking at uh, the environmental impacts, but also the social impacts uh, that uh, certain technologies evolutions can bring. And indeed, the technology themselves that underpin uh, uh, the evolution, but again, uh, uh, from an holistic perspective. So looking at all phases of the life cycle, uh, not just the operational time frame, not just uh, uh, focusing on uh, the vehicle or the optimization of traffic flows, but also looking at uh, the long-term impacts of certain technologies. Uh, one area is when thinking about electric vehicles, more electric vehicles, indeed, uh, is uh, management and disposal of, of batteries, right? So. Uh, the energy storage for ground vehicle and uh, the energy capacity, so the, uh, the mass uh, to energy and volume to energy ratios are less critical for uh, ground vehicle, but still uh, an important factor. And when looking at the evolutions uh, that uh, uh, the uh, mobility, in particular the intelligent transport system and mobi mobility uh, uh, systems are experiencing, we see that there are substantial evolutions uh, uh, in terms of uh, vehicles. So new concepts like urban air mobility are emerging. Now, nobody knows at the moment how these can integrate uh, within the current intelligent transport system uh, framework, even uh, in uh, uh, looking at the most advanced concepts that have been elaborated. Uh, there are indeed uh, a number of challenges that need to be uh, addressed. One of the main challenges is uh, uh, the, the management, the proper management of operations, so low-level air traffic management and a MAD aircraft system traffic management, or UTM. Right. Um, okay. So, Shravani, hopefully you can hear me better. What policies can help achieve low-carbon urban transportation? Thank you for the question, Hanis. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you well. Cool. So, okay. Um, firstly, I would like to, you know, state the problem of urbanization. I would say urbanization is amazing. However, it comes with its own problems. You know, um, why I'm saying urbanization is amazing is because it gives, you know, a lot of employment and then it um, generates a lot of GDP in our cities. But along with that, it also contributes to a lot of problems such as, you know, emissions from different kinds of transportation. Because um, most of the transportation, uh, most of the emissions come from these transport sector, although that is like an, you know, assumed one because uh, some of the um, emissions also comes from the road dust and also construction sector. However, all these um, cars are mostly in the cities. So now India is only 30%. I'm speaking only from the perspective of developing countries, particularly from India. So now with only 30% urbanization, we see that there are massive transport problems, you know, relating to air quality. Um, um, and as a result of that, uh, people are seeing problems like respiratory diseases, lung cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So now a lot of countries have promised to take different steps uh, to mitigate the problem of air quality. Obviously, you guys know about the Paris Agreement and all those, um, you know, um, um, steps taken. So now um, I would say that um, one theory that is quite popular at the moment, but we still don't pop uh, follow it, honestly, is avoid shift and improve. So what I mean uh, by that is, you know, like if we have our policies based in, um, you know, targeted things, for example, if we are using uh, uh, private transport at the moment, like cars, 
And if we avoid that and we shift to a cleaner transport, like public transport, then it would uh, you know, save us a lot of BKT and the emissions as well. So now if you're already in a public transport or an NMT or an active travel, which means we have already shifted, now we can improve our efficiency, reliability, serviceability, et cetera. So now um, what happens is that we always assume that, okay, this is an utopian idea. Everybody should use public transport, but that clearly does not happen. Now, um, there could be recommendations now coming to that, but along with that, I would like to also state the problem. So the problem and in terms of which we need to focus our recommendations in order to you know, attain all these low carbon emission um, uh, cities uh, nearly you know, in the transportation sector. So one of the reasons why people really don't use last, um, uh, public transport is the problem of last mile connectivity. So you don't have first and last mile connectivity. So it only makes sense if your transportation trip is above seven to eight kilometers. For example, I have to go from my home to my office. So I step out of my home, you know, take a micro mobility service, pay there, get down on the stop, pay there, again go there, and you know, take another micro mobility service. So the overall trip cost is too much, you know. So people don't really um, want to take it. One is because it is very uh, time consuming. Second, it is not affordable. So if we want to focus on, uh, you know, multimodal integration kind of things, so that we ensure last mile connectivity, then probably some part of the emission factor can be covered because a lot of people would be encouraged to use public transport. Then I would say for people like me who are really, you know, mobility enthusiasts and clearly, you know, concerned about the environment and I want to use public transport. However, I go to a bus station and I wait there for minutes and minutes, but we don't know, you know, like if the bus is coming, you know, which number of bus, is there a seat availability, what kind of fare. So I would say, Lack of information or awareness is another barrier and we can focus our policies based on, you know, raising awareness or have apps that could, you know, um, make the public aware of the route timings, etc. Um, then I would say maximum asset utilization. This is particularly for public transport and also shared mobility. So studies show that, you know, car sharing and carpooling can reduce the number of trips to a significant level, resulting on the carbon emissions as well. Um, obviously for public transport. So if we use our existing modes of travel, particularly for cars, because studies show that one car sits on a public, uh, on a par uh, parking spot, sorry, I'm blabbering, um, parking spot for 95% of the time. Uh, imagine I go to a place um, and then, you know, from my home to the other one. So there is only one work trip. And by the time I come back, it, I'm nearly exhausted to take another social trip. So why don't I use my car to, you know, um, make it use of like car sharing or carpooling where I can take maximum amount of people in the same ride. Then I would say the other one would be infrastructure. So softer aspects such as luminescence or visibility index, or I would say, uh, you know, um, infrastructure for cycling and pedestrianism would encourage active and NMT transport. So that is another policy aspect that we can focus upon. And lastly, I would say from the planner's perspective is if we make some differences in our zoning regulations, for example, uh, if we follow the famous uh, theory by Jane Jacobs, which means eyes on street, uh, if we encourage mixed high density development, this would, you know, encourage people to use the public spaces more and um, the cycling and public transport even in a much efficient level. So, yeah, that sums up my answer. That's interesting. Um, and I was particularly, I actually came across an article that mentioned uh, using in AI to understand when the next uh, bus is coming or when the, the when the seats are available so that you can plan your routes better and your time better, right? So I think that's uh, being done in Spain, if I'm not wrong. So that's something I would look forward to because I don't want to wait um, uh, minutes or hours at the bus station or in, on a bu at the bus stop, not knowing what's going to happen, right? Um, in India, I think your your weather is the same as ours. It's it's actually very humid, so being out there too long doesn't doesn't jive with me. So, <laughs> so doctor, next question, Dr. Uh, Professor Roberto, what challenges would passenger air transport pose in cities? And how is Australia, in particular, preparing its infrastructure and regulations? Yeah, I think uh, uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, 
um, I think using more time efficient uh, kind of operations. The multimodal transformation, if done correctly, and uh, uh, Shivani mentioned a number of uh, ongoing initiatives, both uh, technological and regulatory initiatives, it can facilitate uh, uh, an evolution of intelligent transport systems. Um, so time efficiency is one of the main targets, uh, and one of the main areas that can be improved um, for the benefits of the user community, and eventually progressively as people experience uh, the benefits uh, of this transformation, uh, eliciting a uh, higher level of investments. Um, one uh, clear example is the adoption of intelligent transport systems connecting the urban environments and the urban public transport with the, uh, the aviation network, right? The movement, uh, there's not much uh, uh, being done, although research uh, has uh, in fact moved uh, uh, and, and produce quite substantial uh, outcomes that maximize time efficiency of operation. And to give you an example, to match uh, uh, your challenge uh, uh, description, right? So waiting at the bus station without knowing what's happening. Intelligent transport system with appropriate uh, uh, vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure provision, communication, uh, bring uh, a lot of opportunity in that perspective. You know exactly when to catch the bus to get to the airport, to catch your airplane. And obviously you need uh, uh, full uh, uh, effective multimodal integration. To do that properly, inevitably there must be advantages, advances in the information technology uh, domain, the cyber dimension. And this calls for a number of challenges in the area of cyber and physical security, so which do not just affect the vehicle, but all the decision making that is done centrally. Uh, the software engineering community has made uh, substantial uh, contributions to enhancing uh, safety as well as, excuse me, uh, security as well as safety, uh, but uh, um, Farther, farther significant uh, advances are needed, in particular uh, to bring uh, uh, explainability uh, to many of the algorithms that have been developed using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, if uh, uh, we are to uh, really make uh, a strong case, we can't look at just uh, uh, efficiency or time efficiency or uh, environmental sustainability in isolation. We also need to include the uh, fundamental objectives in terms and requirements in terms of safety, excuse me, in terms of security, cyber and physical security, and cyber and physical interoperability. Okay, that's another very important uh, aspect. And it's often neglected, but uh, uh, interoperability uh, between uh, systems uh, not just uh, at uh, uh, a hardware and software level, but also at the signal space level, and ultimately looking at the human interactions uh, with uh, such systems. So we are now talking about complex cyber physical social systems, right? Uh, it is uh, really essential to address the interoperability conundrum um, in the, uh, with, with substantial measures that are not just technological. They are really uh, regulatory measures that facilitate the introduction of this technology. But unless uh, the, the security aspect is, uh, uh, is resolved, and uh, I mentioned the many challenges that uh, we experience, both on the physical and on the cyber dimension, uh, you know, we, we, we are not going to uh, be able to bring uh, to full fruition this solution. I give an example. Some of the challenges that uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the transformation of you know, smart cities and in the transformation of intelligent multimodal transport system, one of the great challenges is uh, effectively the, uh, uh, the communication links uh, between uh, 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 the cyber, so software, and uh, the physical elements of the cyber physical system, right? And uh, the 
there have been significant evolution. So the way of transforming data, converting data to analog to di from analog to digital and vice versa, uh, is now well defined and uh, is a patrimony of the uh, uh, scientific and engineering uh, communities. But uh, uh, what happened as a consequence of this mechanism? Some threats, uh, say uh, jamming or meconing, which are physical threats, actually do materialize in the cyber dimension and vice versa. So some threats that are introduced, a virus that introduced in the cyber uh, at the software level will affect the physical uh, network as well. And I'm talking here about uh, potentially autonomous vehicles that make decisions in real time. And so these are the key challenges that need to be addressed. Um, again, uh, build a serious business case about uh, uh, these. We need to look at uh, how our cities, our urban environments are evolving, various forms of transport, the advantages that can be brought in by each of them, and then the, uh, the advantages that the cyber-physical integration can bring, uh, both uh, 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 in terms of autonomous systems, but with them we can only go that far, and uh, the full uh, 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 integration between uh, cyber-physical and human towards uh, uh, what, what the scientific community uh, is now calling cyber-physical human or cyber-physical social systems. So we're effectively uh, uh, the human is still having a very important role in terms of high-level decision-making, completely different from the present uh, tactically-oriented decision-making, which uh, cannot really address the complexities of the system as we are already experiencing them today. And again, this will be a pervasive kind of technology that will uh, impact uh, uh, the, the key decision-makers, the policy-makers, technologists and the operators um, contributing to the efficient, sustainable and effective uh, management uh, of the intelligent transport system network. Again, this calls for a very holistic approach, uh, um, but I'm confident that, uh, you know, uh, once uh, uh, key measures of performance are identified uh, as a result of extended consultation and collaboration, then the system can evolve naturally uh, with the, you know, the introduction of advanced uh, 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 autonomous and intelligent uh, uh, systems technologies of present day. Um, okay, thank you, Professor. Shravani, uh, companies like Siemens work across a number of transportation industries. So what becomes of uh, things like regional rail systems with connected vehicles uh, where you're able to better optimize existing road uh, infrastructure? Can, intellig in can, can intelligent transportation systems and public transit coexist? That's a very good question, um, Hanis. Thank you. So um, I think to ensure effectiveness and a low cost, energy efficiency, et cetera, public transport um, goes hand in hand with ITS. So some of the key components of ITS, um, I'm sure everybody knows about it, is advanced uh, traffic management systems, uh, fleet management, which is quite important, advanced um, uh, travel information, I would say, um, then there would be electric payment or ticketing, which is quite convenient at this point of time, you know, where we are ensuring social distance, etc. You know, so um, in Indian cities, of course, a lot of state governments are already doing this. Um, ITS, however, a classic example would be BRT, which means bus rapid transit systems. So uh, one of the classic examples is also in Bogota. Um, and in India, in the western part, uh, called Ahmedabad, we still do have this BRT, which is a super hit uh, story. So now uh, there are still some of the cities which are quite struggling to, you know, achieve this uh, spot on facility. And I think it is quite convenient for us to achieve it, provided the times that we are in now, you know, like uh, such advanced softwares, technologies, cloud based computing systems, etc. So now um, I would again uh, address it as I have previously, uh, you know, addressed it, that what is the problem and what is again the policy recommendation. So uh, number one would be even if it, we are having a good ITS system, information system, 
um, there would be a clear lack of legitimacy or self-explanatory systems, you know, which creates a big digital divide for the elderly people. So we're not, uh, you know, um, using universal accessibility as a whole. So we're not being inclusive. So in ITS, we need to ensure that all of the uh, commuters, say the citizens, should be able to use it. So in a user-friendly manner, so that they can have all the information available. Second is um, institutional coordination is a big problem that we see. Sometimes we want to get a thing done. However, to get the permissions and everything, it takes so much time that people just lose patience, even though if they have the right intent to do so. So making the uh, system a little bit more transparent, flexible would, you know, speed up the process. Then um, the other one would be multimodal integration again. So how do you have a connected system? For example, um, uh, the London's, uh, you know, um, card would be one of the classic examples. There would be Oyster cars and then there would be, you know, so many other transport systems that would ensure um, cost-effective multimodal integration with ITS. Then um, I would say in the coming uh, policies, if we, you know, allocate some of the funds in hardcore research and innovation, R&D, that would be one of the biggest factors because now we see youth is the future. So if you encourage them to have innovative ideas for ITS, ITM, then they could, uh, you know, like integrate all these things in a sustainable manner system. Then I would say signal synchronization, how do you ensure that? Because this is human behavior, you know, like for example, I want to go from my home to my friend's place. It's a long stretch. However, when I take my car, uh, it's my bad luck that I get all the signals to be red. So by the time I reach the third signal, I would become restless. I would start honking. I would just want to, you know, move out. And then, you know, like, I don't care if I crash somebody, you know. So you have to ensure how to have the smooth uh, transition from one signal to, to the another by, you know, uh, also ensuring that you don't have a massive queue length behind. So that is one way that you can, uh, you know, incorporate ITS in public transport. Then um, another thing is sustainable transport, uh, sustainable business models. So for now, in these times, we see that the entrepreneurs and the startups are clearly struggling. So if we have innovative business models like BOO, BOOT, etc., you know, build, operate, transfer, all those kind of things, where uh, uh, the financial institutions also step down and have a holistic approach of understanding the overall ITS, ITM, then it could go in hand in hand. One another information is about pedestrian traffic safety, which we don't uh, emphasize on a lot. So um, ITS only means to public transport, but we have to look at it from a very holistic point of view. So pedestrian traffic safety is also something that can be achieved through ITS or ITM. So um, lastly, I would say again, maximum asset utilization, existing assets can be utilized to ensure, you know, fleet management and uh, understanding the rate availability, seat availability, passenger information. So these could have um, enormous impacts on ensuring, you know, uh, efficient public transport along with, um, I would say, um, um, you know, different kinds of business models, etc. So yeah, that sums up my question. Awesome. All right, um, Professor, it seems uh, I will also ask you, Sherbani, after Professor. So, this is for both of you. It seems as though there are a lot of different expectations in the industry about the advent of uh, connected and autonomous vehicles. What are your thoughts of, on where we are with them? So you mean what what industry is doing to meet uh, the expectation or yes. yes and where we are where which point are we at now but well, uh, uh, industry uh, and um, is is making significant investments in uh, the uh, development of new technologies uh, that can support uh, uh, you know, this evolution, the evolution of the uh, intelligent mobility from one side and uh, uh, overall uh, um, 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 vehicles as well, uh, evolution. So I'm sure you're aware of the advances that are taking place in the area of intelligent mobility and vehicles. And overall, uh, uh, at the uh, provisions that may be made in terms of software and hardware for uh, uh, intelligent transport systems uh, and multimodal integration. Uh, 
there are some open challenges and i think uh, here uh the industry requires some uh significant uh, uh support uh, uh to build a business case from that perspective it's important to have uh, the backing from the government the governments and uh, the, the kind of regulatory uh, organization uh, that uh, will contribute to an international definition of international uh, standards uh, that uh, uh, aim to maximize efficiency, uh, reduce environmental impact, uh, and uh, also reduce uh, uh, and, and mitigate uh, um, the impacts of uh, increasing level of traffic uh, in urban environments. So there are uh, um, there are needs for uh, eventually, um, uh, in my opinion, um, investments as as we discussed before in certain kind of technologies, but also uh, in line with the uh, evolution of the regulatory framework that can facilitate those investments. Obviously, industry will not invest unless they have uh, users that are going to. Uh, uh, introduce uh, and, and buy a certain kind of product. At the end of the day, that's what industry does. So the government has to facilitate and influence the decision making that brings uh, uh, and, and boosts innovation in, in certain areas. So the business case has to be supported by a social impact case. Uh, and again, uh, one of the key areas to be targeted is also uh, the environmental sustainability uh, of what uh, uh, new uh, forms of uh, intelligent transport system can offer. Um, it's a complex topic. Uh, there are clearly safety implications, security implications, technological implications, uh, interoperability implications, uh, and environmental sustainability. So all of that uh, require uh, a careful consideration um, uh, of the various elements that, keep, that play a fundamental role. So governments, as much as industry, need to work together, academic institution as well, and research organization can make a, a significant contribution, uh, rising the level of uh, public perception, the level of uh, uh, public uh, um, uh, um, acceptance and uh, um, awareness of uh, certain technologies, what they can do for them uh, will be important. Educating uh, not just the next generation of engineers, but also the next generation of policy makers and uh, the broader communities uh, is also important. Um, so uh, there will not be uh, a rapid uptake of uh, these technologies unless uh, a clear business case is brought in and in order for that business case to be uh, brought uh, and, and to fruition effectively uh, the industry has to produce not just uh, uh, technical evidence of what they can achieve but uh, uh, substantial tangible um, um, economical benefits that can be measured. Uh, so one way of doing it, uh, uh, just giving you an example from my particular experience, within the United Nations the Specialized Agency for Aviation, ICAO, when, uh, uh, you know, uh, now when we are, when we develop a particular technology to enhance sustainability of air transport, the first question we need to answer is, yes, but what is the bottom line? What is also the economic, how, we can, how, how can we quantify the economical benefits that uh, the introduction of a new standard or the introduction of a new technology uh, will bring uh, uh, to the community, the nation that introduced those, those measures? It's more and, a hype, basically. Exactly. So they want to know the bottom line more and more. Uh, policymakers are in the same kind of uh, situation uh, of the economical impact do not have just to be seen as a negative kind of impact because I'm doing investments in the research and development of certain technologies also in terms of the benefits and in the long term uh, will be introduced by the adoption of these technologies 
And again, this requires uh, in-depth uh, modeling and simulations in the area of econometric business. Uh, so we need advanced business models for the operators as well. They need to integrate uh, seamlessly with the technological uh, kind of uh, engineering simulations and also obviously within uh, 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 the, the operational dimension. So I mentioned before the importance of uh, solving key issues like uh, which we impact and can endanger the introduction of, and the fruition of intelligence transport systems like cyber physical security uh, and interoperability aspects. So these are all uh, very hot topics that need to be addressed holistically, not just looking at the technology again, looking at the policy evolutions, looking at the regulatory framework evolutions uh, that are necessary, but again, also producing clear, tangible evidence of the economical benefits uh, uh, that we can bring uh, uh, to our communities. Very, very important. Shravani, would you like to add to this? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Professor, for so beautifully explaining the thing. But I would, um, you know, uh, talk about a study that I had done recently and a paper that I had presented in WCTR. But um, this was, again, from the perspective of a developing country, again, from India's perspective. So now connected autonomous vehicles is something that I really wanted to study the readiness index of the people. So what happens is sometimes people are actually, you know, investing so many ideas and um, infrastructure investments. However, um, you see that people are not really using it. So we need to capture the consumer's perspective also sometimes to, you know, like implement such massive technologies. So clearly, um, I had in mind the readiness index, the awareness. So being literate does not mean that you're aware of a certain kind of technology. So if they're aware of the autonomous vehicles at all in India, and also the willingness to accept um, the uh, tech new technology if it comes to the Indian market. So these are the three factors that were covered in this uh, study and about like 200 people were surveyed. So I'll give you a brief idea about the demographics that I had. Um, 18 to 30% were, uh, 18 to 30 uh, age group were, 86% and 12% were 30 to 60 and 2% were again uh, 60 and above. So because you have 2% 60 and above, this shows a clear digital divide here. You know, online surveys are sometimes biased and skewed, I would say, because you don't have access uh, for the elderly people getting online surveys. So even if they have smartphones, they might not have internet. And even if they have internet, they might be using it for FaceTiming their friends and relatives and not acquire travel information. So that is one. Um, then I had 60% male and 40% female. And also I covered employment aspects that um, if they were involved in a private institution or a public organization, or they were students or they were unemployed to ensure the trip uh, length that they um, you know, covered in a day-to-day -day basis. Then I also asked them if they owned a vehicle or not to understand the you know, concept on relevance of the topic. So most of the people, respondents owned the vehicle. So um, the next question that was quite evident uh, for my study was, if these AVs come to the Indian market, are you going to use it? Okay, so um, I was having a, quite a panic attack that I'll be getting all of them no, but surprisingly, 49.68% said yes, and 50.31 said no. Um, so people who wanted to use it, it's because they wanted to have this thrill of you know, trying something new and exciting. Um, that was one of the biases that they had. Um, the other one was hassle-free driving. So obviously in Indian cities, it's so crowded. So, um, you know, um, being able to reach a destination from point A to point B without driving is a luxury in itself. So they were quite interested on those aspects. However, I also asked if you're not willing to use it, what are the reasons? Okay. So people were really skeptical about the existing infrastructure. So we clearly don't have lane driving, et cetera, you know, which causes a lot of road traffic accidents. So um, AVs could get really confused in those, uh, you know, um, areas in road safety aspects. The other one was, um, everybody knows about it, about our culture of heterogeneous traffic. It's not only different modes of traffic, you know, cars, buses, autos, but we also do have animals on the street and people running from here and there. Yeah. So, yes, they will get crazy. So if you don't have a control environment, then that's a massive challenge. 
The other one was awareness and perception of the people that was a hindrance or barrier to accepting these technologies. So how well aware are you? You know, how, how willing are you would again change with the information that you have. So do we have those kind of information? No, at the moment. Um, then I would say policy is the easiest part of the document to me. However, implementing it is a challenge. So, so I would say um, one of the aspects that came out of it was policy implementation was a big barrier to you know um, uh, implementing such ideas. The other last thing that came up was safety aspects, which I would again say it is a memory bias because the time it was surveyed, um, the accident just happened, the tragic accident about uh, you know the road safety about uh, uh, the women that had um, had massive you know problems regarding the autonomous vehicles. So they might be really scared of uh, that situation at that point of time. So safety was an aspect. However, if it comes to India, I don't see it's a clear challenge provided we uh, follow a certain things because at the moment we are struggling with, um, you know, adequacy and efficiency in terms of public transport availability. Second is also we are having a clear challenge in the transition of ICE vehicles to electric vehicles. So then comes AV. But if it comes, it is going to be a hit because obviously India is one of the largest automobile manufacturers as well. So if it comes, uh, then economy-wise, it's going to be a super hit. Secondly, if we have uh, phase-wise development, for example, we target the HTVs or HEVs, which means high emission vehicles, you know, like in freight ones, delivery services, those could be uh, very useful to Indian context where you have, you know, highways and stuff like that. The other one could be um, implementing all these small cars like pods in Dubai could be in controlled environment, for example, in institutional areas or in airports or in railway systems. These could be really beneficial. Then again, strategic and strict enforcement of the policies is number one. Um, and then R&D, obviously, and encouraging startups, um, uh, startups and uh, manufacturers, you know, local um, skill development and capacity building would enhance all these as a facilitator or a catalyst to encourage um, and adopting these new technologies in developing countries like ours, with, which has massive um, you know, challenges in terms of um, mixed traffic. Yeah. All right. Very good point, Sasha. Um, OK, I've got one last question uh, for Professor Roberto. So in your opinion, uh, which region or which metropolis Will we, can we actually expect to see the first functioning flying taxi service? Uh, because I know Singapore, they already have Skypods, but um, I'm not very sure about the acceptability from its residents. I know they are building the infrastructure already, um, but what, what are your thoughts and why there? Well, uh, yeah, there are many uh, initiatives around around the world that, uh, in fact, they are developing new uh, prototype technologies, and some of them have been uh, matured enough to be uh, flight tested, right? So there are there are already uh, flying autonomous vehicles, including um, you know um individual and uh, and collective forms of autonomous transport that have been tested uh, in uh, uh, various countries you mentioned singapore actually melbourne has been identified uh, so i'm lucky i live in melbourne has been identified as the first non-us city uh, where uh, a flying taxi prototype will be tested by uber uh, in three years time that was the plan uh, uh, a few months ago um, COVID might have impacted slightly this, this plan, but I would expect that uh, uh, Melbourne will join, uh, uh, you know, cities in the United States um, to accomplish uh, um, this very important milestone in terms of, uh, uh, you know, enhancing the value proposition of urban air mobility. Um, so the concepts are maturing. I would say the level of uh, technology from a vehicle perspective is relatively high. We already have uh, uh, flying prototypes, uh, not scale prototypes, actually full scale uh, um, uh, prototypes. Um, to, to allow, however, these systems to, to uh, be uh, produced um, at the required level, at the required 
in the required quantity and being uh, utilized so to fly around in, in our cities, there are significant evolutions needed in terms of uh, air traffic management. So this uh, includes both the airspace allocation and the associated risk analysis, um, which is uh, at the moment uh, a strategic task. So the, the airspace sectors, as they're called, uh, are defined upfront. And also the geofences are defined uh, before the flight take place. So in terms of as a strategic offline task uh, of air traffic management. Uh, the scientific community and industry, uh, key industry actors like Boeing and uh, Airbus agree that this is not uh, sustainable in the long term. So advanced real-time dynamic uh, adaptation schemes will have to be introduced in terms of airspace uh, management provisions. This calls for what is uh, the, the scientific community defined as dynamic geofences. Uh, effectively, these geofences will uh, uh, define uh, you know, the risk of collision of drones with uh, uh, buildings, objects, uh, and human-made natural carrying obstacles and other drones. Uh, so the complexity of uh, the problem uh, is uh, in intuitively quite significant. Uh, there has been for many years uh, emphasis of uh, the technology, one technology that is uh, uh, detect and avoid. Uh, we need to go beyond the detect and avoid uh, that has been uh, clearly assessed and develop effectively a unified methodology that incorporates uh, separation assurance uh, and collision avoidance, both for man and unmanned aircraft. So one of the key challenges obviously is uh, uh, Seem to, towards a seamless integration of man and unmanned aircraft uh, and autonomous and non autonomous vehicles is, uh, yeah, is the ability to perform cooperative and non cooperative surveillance seamlessly. You can't think of an operator in an intelligent transport system center or you know, whatever this uh, uh, UAS traffic management control center will look like dealing with man and unmanned aircraft differently and making decisions tactically uh, regarding uh, you know, uh, any potential uh, risk of collision. This is not possible. So a lot can be done offline with appropriate airspace provisions, process the level of risk and modify uh, both uh, the trajectories and the airspace uh, kind of communication, navigation and surveillance uh, provisions. But also, uh, there is much more that needs to be done in real time. So this calls for evolution in the communication uh, domain with uh, uh, both line of sight and beyond line of sight uh, uh, communication in real time. Uh, present day satellite based geostationary communication are not adequate because they have a latency approximately two uh, three seconds, which is not adequate obviously for uh, a very short time frame to react uh, of uh, urban air traffic. And there are advances also needed in the area of navigation. Uh, so more uh, accurate and intelligent kind of navigation system capable to reconfigure. I'll give an example. In urban canyons, all right, so in uh, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, urban air mobility vehicle will fly in uh, uh, in between uh, tall buildings, it's inevitable that GPS, uh, uh, so the global, global position system, another form of GNSS, uh, global navigation satellite system, will not be available as they are uh, when you have an unobstructed view of the sky. As a result, uh, there is a need for integration. But other sensors and system uh, offer different advantages and have different limitations in different scenarios. So. Uh, this calls for the adoption of advanced uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques uh, to effectively make the, the right decision at the right time regarding the level of integrity, not just accuracy uh, or continuity that can, can be provided by such systems and come up with the best possible compromise. In all conditions. Another very important area that needs uh, to evolve is that of uh, integrated vehicle health management systems. 
And again, uh, the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning in such system uh, that are now becoming safety critical uh, uh, will uh, be at the core of this transformation. And we rely on a fusion of uh, uh, you know, avionic systems on board and uh, contributing CNS systems on the ground, providing a constant diagnosis and prognosis uh, of both the vehicle and the uh, infrastructure that contribute to a safe mission. So it's continuous so it's communication. Because of that, uh, sorry, what was the question? It's a continuous communication between parties. Correct. So that, that's exactly was exactly my point. Thank you very much. So because of that, uh, the communication system, the communication network, both on the ground and in the air, need to evolve. Um, so uh, technologies uh, that have been explored for many years, like SWIM, system-wide information network as part of CESAR, Single European Sky ATM Research and Next Gen, uh, will not be sufficient. New forms of advanced air-to-air -air and air-to-ground data link communication need to emerge. And this system need to be high throughput indeed, but also secure. So they need to implement uh, this important cyber and physical security provisions uh, that will ultimately allow the intelligent transport system network to evolve uh, and to provide a continuous uninterrupted and safe service in all conditions. Thank you so much for that elaborate um, explanation. And I guess we can just look forward to having Melbourne uh, be the first metropolis where we can see flying taxis. Uh, for Malaysia, I think we have a long way to The first known US, the first known US. <laughs> yeah, US, 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 Australia, India, Thank India, so hopefully soon too, but it might, I think you have a few things that you might need to sort out first in terms of even ground transportation. Yeah, in our region of the world, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Asia. Uh, Asia and developing countries, we still have a lot of things to sort out before we can see things flying in the air. So, so thank you again for joining me today. And I look forward to, to meeting you um, in the future. Um, for the audience out there, if you would like to uh, have further questions for our guests, you can reach out to us and we will forward the questions to them. Thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.